when I was young, me and Ronnie Pierce, my neighbor, would sneak. You remember old Ronnie? Okay, we would go down there on a Friday night or Saturday. You know, it didn't get dark to nine at night in summertime, you know? Well, we would come down here, go down the old gravel alleys, and we would go to that first building, and there was bushes and weeds. And we would go along in there and just kind of sit down in the grass. Right over there, right down over there was the creek. Right. You could sit there at night and listen to the bullfrog. Groom. Anyway, they would play this music, and the people would all be out there dancing. Whatever that music was, I liked it. A young kid, but I liked that music. Well, I went, one, night, one time I went home and Mom says, you been down to that old club again? I said, well, Mom, they, they play a music down there. I said, you never hear here. I told about the music. She says, well, they call that the blues. I've liked the blues ever since. That's why every Sunday night I go out here. you got to go. And that's me, Hawkeye, and my dog, Tippy. Gary Woody and John Tippy. 1959. 1959. We should first say that, aside from being a local legend, um, Woody's important as a resource because you worked at the club as a kid. It was a driving range. A guy by the name of um, Nate Green uh, rented that area from Mr. Tate. Yeah. And uh, he put all that, spent a lot of money, put this golf driving range. Well, one day he came up when I was living with my aunt up here on the corner, offered me a summer job. They had this old tractor. It had a great big flywheel on the side, so this thing was loaded with baskets. I would drive that thing all over every morning and picking up those miserable golf balls. <laughs> Nate would come every weekend and give me the 20. He paid me $20 a week. Well, a 15-year-old kid, that was pretty good money. Here's Oklahoma going south, right along Big Walnut Creek. And as it comes around the curve, there's a gazebo there now. This was the storage building. This was the cement dance area, the bandstand. This is where the guys would, the band, and they would all dance. The clubhouse, and this was all parking lot. And this was the, st the steps into the building. And uh, the old iron steps were back here someplace. What's left of them. And over here was a cottage, another cottage. The guy in the last cottage put in cement steps to the creek. They're still there today. Then there was the clubhouse, of course, and it was all naughty pine. It was really nice. Uh, before air conditioning, they just had big ceiling fans. But a, a little old short man, his name was L.C. He never knew his last name. The only thing he knew was he thinks he was from Mississippi. He was told that. Didn't know his mother or father. Didn't know how old he was. And he always wore a white apron. He had real, real, real short white hair. He would always polish that building, keep it clean. He did all the cooking. And me and Gary would go in there, and he'd always sit a glass and pour us Coke. Yeah, pick. yeah and there's, there's Ernest Tate. Mm -hmm. There's Grandpa. He always had a cigar. He yes, always sir. wore a suit. He always pulled his tie down and roll. He didn't take his suit jacket off. He would roll it up and get down on his knees because he had flowers and he'd work in the flower beds. Instead of LC out there working in the flower bed, he did it himself with that big old cigar. And we, as kids, would go down there on our bicycles or walk down and we'd say, Hi, Grandpa. Why, hello there, kids. You know, oh, he. So when I look at ads, it says, oh, come on to the Big Walnut Country Club. There's golf, volleyball, horseshoes, badminton, baseball, croquet, picnics. Out. That was a lot of space. It's a I big mean, area. Tons, tons of space. Who are the girls, I wonder? That was the 1952 Summer Festival beauty pageant contestants. That festival was right here, and they had tons of people. There's even a... a paragraph in the article that says, we have arranged with the city of Gehenna for an additional 500 parking spaces. Wow. Additionally. And you were, were you pretty good friends with Ernest Tate as well, or did you work more with Nate Green? Worked for Nate Green. Oh, and what I wanted to tell you about Nate, a lot of times he didn't show up on the weekends, two or three, four weekends in a row. So Thomas Larry would always give me my $20. And I always asked Thomas, I said, well, where's Mr. Green? Where's Nate? 
Oh, uh, yeah, uh, he's in Florida. He's on vacation. Yeah. No, he wasn't. He was in jail because he played numbers. Remember the numbers thing? Yeah. So, so Tommy Gales. <laughs> yeah. Did Nate Green was in jail, I think, more than he was out. But he yeah. had a family, he had kids and everything. But, uh... And, well, and Ernest Tate had a couple businesses down in Columbus. Yeah, he had a dry cleaners, and I don't know what the other was, maybe, but they'd say he had a dry cleaner. And one night, me and Gary are camping off at Rocky Fork. We had Camp One Devil, one of our old campsites. So Gary and I went walking because we could barely hear it. sound like radio or music, but it sounded like it was down Crick's Meat. So we followed Rocky Fork down, and we come up out of the woods there, right at their little trail there. It goes right down to where Rocky Fork comes into that little trail, still there today. Uh -huh. I call it the triangle. We come up that little trail, and right there was a big yellow convertible car. Summertime, the top down, it's dark. These Back couple, there for privacy, probably. They were smooching. And Gary and I, they went down and they turned around. So when Gary and I come up, the car was right there and there was the trunk of the car. So Gary and I, we looked at each other and we went, we snuck up on the car and went, ha! Like that, beat on that car. That car was spinning tires all the way back to the car. I don't know, as a little boy, what they were doing, but uh, in the front seat or the back seat, but uh, they were doing something. But uh, I'll never forget that night. <clears throat> hey, Woody, who was the family that moved in? You said when the club closed down, the family moved in, they had a whole heap of kids. Oh! Oh, Bay okay. Sampson. Oh, God. Yeah, he was in this cottage over here. Okay. And he had a great big old pot belly right in the middle of it. And he drove a trash truck. Bay was a super guy. Him and his wife, and they had like 40 kids. They just kept having kids. <laughs> old Bay they Sampson. Might have been foster kids or something. Don't know whatever right. become of them. Bay the Samson. kids grew up. We moved. We, I was and, living in and Columbus. And together. Going to Eastmore. And, uh, I don't know. I come back to Gehanna one day and the club's gone. I mean, everything was gone and well, yeah, it was all empty. Windows were broken. And uh, Nelson remembers like around 60 or later than that in Jeeps, they would play like yeah, they, or, and flower bomb each other. Sacks of flour because the weeds were so tall and had been neglected that long by that story time. I wanted to tell you. <clears throat> Ronnie Beers oh, in high school in Woodshop and Metal. Uh, he soldered up a big round tube about this big around and about that long and he soldered on little fins and he made a nose cone. He brought it home. We got our, our hands on a lot of, of uh, charcoal, sulfur. Doc Jenkins would sell sulfur to us in a big jug. We would pay him and go out that front door and take off down that street. Hey, you boys, I'm not allowed to sell you that. He'd come running out of that drugstore. We were gone. What Ronnie and I and Joey were doing, we were making gunpowder in Ronnie's basement under his mom and dad's bedroom. We, it took us a while. We had several quarts of gunpowder that we made, black powder, homemade. We stuffed that thing. We made a wick. We took it down to the old club. It was closed down then. We laid there and we aimed it down towards the cliffs because up there, Rocky Forks, all them houses, there was, there was, there was nothing up there. Yeah. And uh, so we aimed it kind of in that direction. We was a rocket. It's going to fly. Well, we lit the wick. It's just getting dark. We back up. We're looking at this thing. And the wick's burning. It gets up to the end of the tube. It went out. <gasps> we don't know why it went out. We kept etching forward. I was going to say, got, of course, went. Oh. And that thing went kaboom. And there went tire and mound went dirt come down. We run like heck to get home. I went to Antisa's, Joey went to his house, Ronnie went to his. Guess who came by about an hour later and paid me and Ronnie and Joey a visit? Jim Sayer. Oh, Jim Chief Sayer. of Police. Yep. Now, Woody, I know you boys had something to do with blowing up that little mound. You could hear that over Gehanna, that explosion. And uh, he went down there, you know, and checked it all out. And, and uh, it was all fresh, dirt land everywhere. We made stick of dynamite. I mean, that thing, it's one that we're still alive today to tell the story. Jim didn't really do much about it, but he did. I remember him saying, if you guys are going to make a bomb, 
blow up that old clubhouse down because it was still standing. If it was before, after 59, that flood in 59 would have taken it out, I think. Yeah, I remember the flood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when the water went down, there were trapped carp and big catfish all over, mm -hmm. down, down here in that lower area. And there would be pools of water, and they'd be trying to get, we got her, yeah. We bring them up and give them the doughy day. Well, I remember so when I, flood, I, mean, I, was, I was on the bridge. Oh, were you? Yeah. yeah. yeah.